In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
lives of your humble servants. Reach out to defend us from evil by the word and work of your majestic <coughs> right hand. Grant this, we pray, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> A reading from Ezekiel. <coughs> so you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for, you are, for why will you die? O house of Israel, and you, son of God, say to the people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver them when he transgresses, and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it when he turns from his wickedness, and the righteous shall not be able to live by his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet, if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is right, what is just. He shall surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just. When it, when it is their own way that is not just, when the righteous turn from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turn from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just, O house of Israel. I will judge each of you according to his ways. The word of the Lord.
Corinthians. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For that, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be adulators as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but were written down for our instructions on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest, lest, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it, and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. At this time, we invite any children with us to come forward for a children's message. So good to see you all. Good morning, children. Are we
remember, together is good. I'll say good morning, and you can say good morning, Pastor Bill. You ready? Good morning, children. Good morning, Pastor Bill. Oh, I love it. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, who knows what this is? That's a pencil, right? It's a pencil, right? All right, let's pretend. You, you all go to school? Everybody go to school? Yeah, okay. So let's pretend you're at school, and you're sitting at a table with some other people, and the teacher says, okay, everybody, I want, we're going to draw a picture, so I want everybody to take out a pencil and let's start to draw. And you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot my pencil. I don't have a pencil. And you look over, and the person sitting next to you has left their pencil laying there, and they're not looking, and you just kind of take the pencil. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That was a bad choice? How do you know it was a bad choice? Yes. Now, now they don't have their pencil, and you said you can feel bad about it? Yeah, that's right. So when we do something wrong, sometimes, well, when we do all the time, really, when we know it's wrong, all of a sudden we feel funny. Like, what if the teacher came up and said, did you take his pencil? How would you feel then? Okay. Yes, I did, right? And so... We know sometimes when we've done something wrong because we feel funny about it or we even maybe hear kind of a still, small voice in our head saying, you should not have done that. I wish you hadn't done that, right? Yeah, sometimes you might even hear the voice like the teacher saying, you should not have done that. That was bad. Well, when we know we've done something bad, God wants us to do something about that, right? So how do we know when we've done something bad as far as God is concerned, or as God feels about us, well, we know because we have God's Word in the Bible, right? And so in the Bible, for example, it says, you shall not steal. So we know taking something that somebody else's is wrong, right? And so we've heard that word, it's inside of us, and so when we steal something, all of a sudden we feel, oh, I shouldn't have done that, right? So when you feel funny about something, like, ooh, I don't think that was good, or you even hear a voice, that may be God's voice saying, you have done something wrong. You've made a bad choice. And what God wants us to do when we do that is to turn away from that bad choice and go to God, turn back to God and say, oh God, I'm so sorry. I did take that pencil. I know you didn't want me to do that. Please forgive me. And the wonderful thing is when we do that, God hears us, he loves us, and he does forgive us. There's a big word that, that's really in all the Bible readings we've heard today. It's called repent. Can you say repent? Repent. Let's say it again. Say repent. 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 Yeah, well, to repent means to turn away <coughs> from bad choices and to the good choices that God has for us and wants us to, to make in our lives, okay? And so whenever you maybe realize you've done something wrong, then remember, ooh, I've got to not do that, and I need to ask God to forgive me, and then I need to make it right, okay? To turn away from those things. So, uh, the, and you know what? The, la the best thing about it is, what's one more thing? The best thing about it is, the next time maybe you feel like, oh, I should take that pencil even though I know it's not mine, or, you know, I, 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 uh, I want to steal that pencil so I can have one for myself. The next time you're tempted to do that and you feel like you want to do that, you can start, oh, I remember, I feel funny about that, and God said, yeah, don't take something that's not yours. So God will even help us not to make those mistakes a second time, okay? So today, we're remembering that God wants us to turn away from bad choices and to tell him the, the bad things that we do and ask him to forgive us, and he does. He loves us and forgives us, and then he also helps us to remember next time to do better. Okay? All right, so let's pray about that. Let's fold our hands and close our eyes and bow our heads and we pray. Dear God, Dear God please, help us please help us to make good choices. And when we make bad choices, to turn back to you and ask for your forgiveness. And for your help. And for your help. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay.
Thank you so much for listening. You may go back to your seat. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for bringing us here together today to worship you. We pray at this time, as we spend time considering the power of your holy word, may your spirit inspire us to apply it to our lives, to take in your truth and to live it out. We pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to preface our message for today with what you might consider a bit of helpful information. Um, and this bit of helpful information for you really is kind of a kind of a gamble for a preacher to say, but should you need it, should you want it, you have an exit back there and an exit <laughs> over here. Always under the big red red letter exit sign there if you need it. You know, even if you look in the, the um, sheets in your pews, there are directions for each of us, depending on where we're sitting in the in the nave, that you know where to go. If there's some kind of an emergency, thanks to our safety committee, we have that put in place, the strategy for how do we get out of this room should we need to. Now for those worshiping from home, they have the fastest exit possible. I'm moving on to the next thing, so click, and there you go. Now think about it, no matter where you are, no matter what building or, or room that you're in, there's always a way to exit, a way to get out of that building or room. And we have building codes in our country that require those exits, those clear paths to safety, so that no matter where you are, you have a way to get out in case you need it. And those, path those pathways for us are always clearly marked for us, for our benefit. You know, even if you have ever been to one of those escape room places where you go, you pay like 30 bucks a person or something and go with a group of your friends or with your family and, and you go to the escape room and they have different themes for each room and, and you get in there and the, the staff person gives you a little bit of information about how it works and you go in there with your family and you're trying to solve a puzzle or a mystery, a problem, you have to, you have to save the world somehow through your through your puzzle they're giving you in this escape room. And, but the funny thing is, after they're done, the staff person is giving, done giving you their spiel about how everything works, they say, oh, by the way, in case you need it, just press the, the big bar on the door and then you'll be able to get out of here, no problem. So what's the benefit of having these emergency protocols and exit signs and egresses and then all of that? Well, you can walk into a building and know that no matter what happens, you can easily find your way Satan. Not that we walk into a building or, or a room, you know, with a general sense of fear or dread, but it's being it's it's been a part of building codes for so long that that now we probably kind of take it for granted that we have these exit signs when we need them. Unless you're like me and you're in a big building with lots of winding hallways and you go into a room, visit with someone for a while, or get your business done, and then it's time to go, and I'm like, I'm looking for those exit signs. How did I get in here in the first place? How am I going to get my way back out? But knowing that we have an exit, it puts us at ease. It alleviates what could be a dead end or a real problem. So our message for today is good news. We have our exit. We have our exit. And that message comes to us from our second lesson, from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, especially verse 13. So if you brought your Bibles from home with you, or you've got your bulletins there with you, go ahead and underline that verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is what we'll focus on today. So as you're getting there, it's, um, it's where our message comes from today. But, all right, now, so we have that, that picture the idea of, of walking into a building or a room and knowing that we have an exit, we've got that, that idea in our heads. Now picture this, you walk into a building and we'll call that building your daily life, your everyday life. 
That's the building that we're walking into. And why are you walking into this building, living your daily life there? Because you have a purpose, and that purpose is to live the life that God has called you to live every day. And each day, as you go about your business in this building of your daily life, you're going in from one room to another and up and down floors and down winding hallways, and you'll come across all kinds of things in this building of your daily life. Some of those things will be good. Some of those things will be mundane. Some might be difficult or trying or bad. And no matter where you go in this building, there is some kind of darkness that is lurking around, a power that is trying to pull you in, in and away from the life that you are called to live by God. And it feels like a test that is very personally designed just for you. And it feels like that testing is never going to end. We experience temptation to sin after temptation to sin after temptation to sin. And sometimes we fall. Sometimes we avoid it. And on and on we go navigating our way through this building of our everyday life. And if you look around, do you know where your exits are? Have you seen the big, bright red letters? Do you know where the doors, where the windows are? And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we've got our exit sign. From all of our troubles of, tem of temptation in our daily life. All of that temptation in our everyday life, it will not lead us into dead end after dead end. The good news is we have our exit. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, this is what Paul says to us. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now that's a Bible verse that we are challenged to memorize in our discipleship small groups that we offer. And we memorize that verse to be reminded of the assurance of victory that we have in Jesus through faith in him. This victory that we have in Jesus over any temptation that arises in our life. A scripture memory has been an important part of our discipleship of small groups um, through the, the three books that we work through, the curriculum that we have. We memorize about 30 Bible verses. If you've ever tried memorizing scripture or maybe chosen a, a verse or two from the Bible that you just really love or just really speaks to you personally through whatever it is that you're going through at the time, when you think about just one verse of scripture, sometimes we just really hone in on like one phrase of that verse or, or a few words that, that really just kind of jump out off the page and into our hearts. But I have loved this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Like the whole thing, I have loved how much it reminds me of how God really does care for us. Every phrase, of every phrase throughout this verse with the reminder that God really does know what we're going through as we face temptation. And even better than that, he knows what we're going through. Even better than that, he doesn't leave us alone to just spend for ourselves and try to figure it out the best we can. Because he knows we're going to fail at that. But we receive grace in this verse from God providing us the way of escape. The good news is that we have our exit. That's our message for today. So let's just look at this verse, just phrase by phrase, and hear all the wonderful good news that we have from God. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Most of you thought that these temptations that you that you know that you deal with that that were just your own. You thought you were the only one who can't stop falling prey to 
that particular temptation or this temptation in general? Am I to think and operate in the world like I'm the only one who encounters temptation for a certain kind of sin? Paul says no. No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. Everyone deals with temptation to sin. It's a part of being fallen human beings. But good news, God is faithful. Yes, he is. God is faithful. Amen? Amen. Yeah. We can turn to our neighbors and, and ask anyone in this room, can you tell me about a time in your life that you know God has been faithful to you or your family, your friends? If we were to all take the time to do that, just gather here, sharing stories of God's faithfulness, we'd be here for hours. And we could do that, but then you'd be looking for those exit signs. <laughs> God is faithful keeps his promises and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability thank you God and he will not allow us to succumb to or be defeated or destroyed by that darkness that works he sees us he knows what we're going through what we struggle with he knows our thoughts he knows the excuses we try to make he knows the ways that we try to Justify the things that we're doing, but he loves us enough to not let us be stuck in that kind of a life without him there to guide us. Good news. We have our exit. Hear this. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He provides the way of escape for us. So that we can endure all of those temptations to sin. And now here's something that we, we might kind of miss about that, that way of escape, with just having the English translation of scripture before us. If you were to study the Greek um, word for that, for the Greek phrase for, um, for that word, sorry, Greek word for that phrase, it really helps to point, to paint the picture for us of what that exit is like. Here's how one Bible scholar put it, that way of escape. With the temptation, there's always a way of escape. It means a way out of a narrow mountain pass. The idea is of an army apparently surrounded and then suddenly seeing an escape route for safety. No man need fall to any temptation, for with the temptation, there is the way out. And the way out is not the way of surrender, nor of retreat, but the way of conquest and the power of the grace of God. God is the one victoriously leading us out of the temptations that we face. God the Father has given us his son, Jesus, to die for us and be risen again. All out of his great love and mercy for us. But even believing in that, confessing our faith, that yes, Jesus did die for our sins, so that we wouldn't have to just keep fighting a losing battle against sin. Even believing that wholeheartedly, there's a, real, a very real temptation for all of us to fall into complacency. To take for granted that, that exit from the power of sin and death and the devil that Jesus himself provides for us. Every day there's this temptation before us to walk around missing the promises of God and Scripture and His Word. In a lot of our Bibles, maybe the ones that we have from home, our favorite Bibles to read from, the words of Jesus, they're in red letters, clearly marked for us to see the hope that we have in Christ. So as we, as we make our way through Lent, as we make our way to the cross that Jesus so willingly faced for us, what are we to do about this whole temptation thing? Temptation is very much a part of our everyday life. We won't solve temptation by something that we do or by something that we avoid doing. 
We aren't the ones to solve temptation. Luther reminds us in the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, of his explanation of it, when we pray and lead us not into temptation, here's what Luther says we're asking of God. First of all, Luther says, God tempts no one. That's important for us to remember. God doesn't want us to turn away from him. God wants us to turn to him. Luther says, of, and lead us not into temptation. He says, we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. <coughs> Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. And our victory is in Jesus. At any point that Jesus himself was tempted to give in and forsake us, <clears throat> he didn't. He obeyed the will of his Father, and he won the victory for you and for me. And through faith in him, we have the assurance of our victory in Jesus. In Jesus' name.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Mighty Lord, may your Spirit stir us in order that we might learn to be wise and faithful followers of your Son, Jesus. By the Spirit's sanctifying work, help us to lead lives that bring glory to you, drawing others into your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, help us to answer your call to repentance, knowing that what you desire is not vengeance or punishment, but our loving response to your invitation to turn again to you and your ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, Reach out your hand to comfort and uphold those whose lives are in the midst of trial and turmoil. We pray for the victims of war and terrorism, especially remembering those in Ukraine at this time. We pray for those who are victims of disease and disaster, illness and accident flood and drought, famine and starvation. In particular, particular, we lift up before you this morning the family and loved ones of Grace. We pray for Peggy, Dominic, Spanky, Joyce, Russell, Barbara Ann, Joe, Amy, Beverly, and those we now name in our hearts and minds before you. Lord, remember them this day, and through our efforts in your name, bring them quick relief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, ancient of days, you have revealed the mysteries of life in your own good time. Keep us strong and steadfast in our faith, so that neither trial nor temptation may dim for us the glory of our hope. Or take away from us the promised glory that you have prepared for all your saints. Reassure us and keep us strong in the faith that no temptation can overcome the faith in Christ which you have given us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Gracious God, we pray for those serving in the military. We pray for the first responders, police, fire, EMT workers, for doctors and nurses, all these that risk their lives so that we might live in peace and comfort. We pray for your continued blessing and guidance for our Bishop Dan, for our Dean David. We pray for our mission congregations and missionaries around the world, especially for David in Brazil and for the Echoes Ministry in India. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we do commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We share the peace of one another.
supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.